Thank you. So as Benny said, uh, we are going to talk um, about the Wombat pro pro project, which is a, pro a project funded by the, the European, uh, European yeah. Commission. And my name is Olivier Tonard, so on the left, I am working for C uh, Symantec Research Labs, and this is uh, uh, Andy, Mo uh, Andy yeah. Moser from the uni University of Vienna. So just a few words about uh, us. So um, Andy is a postdoc uh, in Vienna, ISEC lab, and as I said, I'm working for Symantec. So I used to be uh, an officer. Now I just resigned from the army, and quite recently I, I joined uh, Symantec to work as a researcher. So what is it about here, the Wombat project? So you see here, uh, it's funded in the, by the EU in the context of um, the framework program seven. And you see here a list of partners that are involved in uh, Wombat. Um, so basically, Symantec is partner, but also TU Vienna, uh, Forth, um, Orange, Eurecom, uh, Ispasec, Ispasec uh, as you may know, um, is running the VirusTotal web service. So in fact, in Wombat, our approach, there are three um, work packages. Uh, which is, which are the following ones. You have the first work package is about uh, data acquisition. So there on the left. So in that work package, what we did before, because the project is running since uh, two and a half years, uh, what we did, we developed and integrated different kind of uh, sensors in order to collect uh, security uh, events. Then we use um, different kind of sensors. So we have a few examples there. Uh, we use honeypots, um, client side and server side. We use crawlers. We use also external feeds. Uh, we have a sandbox also. So I'm going to talk about that a bit uh, later. Then we, we, in the phase two of the project, we um, enrich the data that we collect in order to add some more data, what we call the meta data. And then today I'm going to talk a bit more about um, the work package uh, five here. So that's the third pillar. And the third pillar is about threat analysis. So what is it about in practice? Well, as Ian said uh, in his talk um, this afternoon, in one, but we want also to connect the dots. So in fact, uh, in, I think that everybody has played that kind of game uh, when he or she was, was younger. So the purpose is to connect all dots in order to expose the big picture, hopefully. And when you do that here, it's quite easy because you have, n you have, here, n you have n here the numbering, so it's quite easy, and you see then a nice shuttle. Of course, in the internet, it is less easy because you don't have the information about the numbers here, so you don't know how to connect those, those dots. So how to figure out how to connect the, the, the attacks that we are seeing with different kinds of sensors in order to find the root cause? So this is what we try to do here in Wombat. So in order to generate the data set, what we use, you have a few examples of the data sets that we use in Wombat. We have a data set called SGNet. So SGNet is a network of um, server-side uh, server -side honeypots. And the scripts and sensors are able to learn about new exploits. So it's really a new kind of uh, sensor. Then we have Harmor. Harmor uh, tells us things about the dynamics of client-side uh, threats. Then we have a sandbox called, uh, uh, called Anubis, uh, for those people who know about it. So every piece of malware that we collect through any kind of sensor, we submit it to the sandbox. And we get, of course, the report about the behavior of that new sample. 
Um, we do the same for various total here. So it's a malware scanner, and everybody knows about it. So they are also a partner uh, in Wombat, and every piece of malware that we collect, we submit it to various total. Then the Honey Spider is also a honeypot, but on the client side. And WePowet is, strictly speaking, not a partner, but we use uh, their service to, um, to add some more data to our collection. So you have an idea now of the data set that we uh, have developed. Now, the purpose of Wombat is to share that. And it is not easy to share such kind of data because of you know, some privacy issues. What we did here, we had a layer. We, had, we have developed an API, which is called the WAPI, there, the Wombat API. And the API is, is developed in, in Python. So for those of you who know a little bit of Python, it's very easy to uh, use it. And it is based on SOAP. So SOAP uh, allows us to make requests to an, any sort, any type of uh, data set. So we deployed the WAPI on all the data set that you see here. And in fact, we don't have so much time today to give a demo on how to use it and with, with code uh, snippet. But still, you can go on the website of the project here. And you will see in the proceedings of the workshop that we organized uh, last year, we have given a, a demo to search um, to show how, how to use uh, this WAPI. Uh, code. So just to, to give you one uh, last schema of what the project tried to do, so we have done this b before in, in the first phase. We have developed all the data set. Then we have added another layer here, the Wombat a API. And then today I'm going to talk a little bit more about triage and fire. Fire Andy is going to talk about that in a, a few minutes, in 20 minutes. And I'm going to talk about threat analysis by means of, tr of another framework. Um, so just to give you an idea on two different approaches to analyze and to look at all the data that we uh, observe in the internet. So this layer is uh, mostly about threat analysis and at the attribution of the uh, attacks that we are seeing. OK, so let's start with uh, the, the part on attack attribution and threat analysis. So Voltaire has said that chance is a word void of sense. And there is always a cause for all the things that we observe. So now it is difficult to figure out what is the root cause. And this is the purpose of what we try to do in the last phase of WOMAT. So we talk about uh, the attribution. So what is that? People used to talk about that when we wanted to do what we call IP traceback. So this is in the case of a DDoS. We are not talking about attribution in that meaning. But here, we talk about at, at attribution in the, in the sense of identifying the root causes of the observed uh, events, attacks, by linking them together thanks to a, a series of common features. So it is really about connecting the, the dots, and it is a bit similar to, you know, the criminals in the cyberspace, they have the same modus operandi as the criminals in the real world. So they are going to leave some, some, some traces, they, they are going to leave some fingerprints, and what we try to do is to unveil those fingerprints by linking the events based on a common, uh, based on a series of common features. Now, how to do that is very difficult because there is a danger, of course, uh, you know, that data mining and clustering. When you cluster data, you will find clusters, so uh, you will find patterns. And it's, it's a bit like uh, like a child who, who looks in, in the sky and he, 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 sees cl he can see clouds. And when he sees clouds, he will say, well, that looks like 
a cat, and then another one will, will tell you, well, no, it looks more like a dog. So it's a bit like, like that. So you have to take care on how you cluster things. And just to, il to show you um, uh, a little picture of uh, uh, the danger of uh, this aspect, well, you see here the policeman who, the, 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 there is one that tries to, um, to interpret um, something that is not present, of course. So, um, what we did in triage is a bit different to the clustering that we used to see um, in other domains. Here, in this case, triage is in fact a multi-criteria decision, an decision analysis uh, technique. So we use the MCDA technique to link the events together to the same phenomenon. So basically, this is the, the approach. You have, for example, a set of uh, events here. Basically, you select uh, a, a number of features. So it can be the location of the attacks, it can be the IP address, it can be the target, it can be the type of exploit, the type of malware. So you put as many features as possible, but preferably features that, that do make sense, of course, that, that you know that if you link them by this or that feature, it will m make sense. And then when you have selected the, those features, what we do in triage is the following. We are going to create graphs that show you uh, the clusters with respect to each feature. So it shows you all the attacks that are linked to the, the, the same place, or all the attacks that come from the, the same area, or all the attacks that share the same kind of shell code, uh, and so on and so forth. And then in the last step, what we do, and this is really uh, new, we try to aggregate all those, those different points, points of view. And the way that you do that is very important, of course. You don't just have to take the average of all the, the features, because we have shown that uh, usually it does not work. So you have to aggregate the, uh, the all the, the features in some way that you model the behavior of the phenomena. And this, gi this gives you, in the end, a multi-dimensional graph where you can see all the relationships that make sense for a given uh, phenomenon. So this step, uh, we create some viewpoints here, and here, this is a data fusion step where we try to aggregate all the inputs in order to hopefully ex to expose the big picture. So this is the main idea. So this is quite novel because here there are few people who try to aggregate different points of view by using uh, an MCDA uh, technique. And actually, I, I've shown in my uh, thesis that you can, that, or in fact, find uh, if you uh, Google, it, you will find it. I, will, I, I have shown that if you use the average of all the criteria, so for instance, two events that seem to come from the same place, but more or less, then they, they share a, common, a number of features, but they are all, you know, 0 0.5 and not really 1, but 0 0.5. Well, you are going to link together events that are probably or very likely not due to the same uh, phenomenon. Whereas if you use other kind of aggregation function, such as uh, weighted, uh, an ordered weighted average, or if you use an integral of uh, Choquet, then you can model the interactions between features. You can model behaviors that are more complex. And that's all the, the point um, of this approach. Like, for example, if you use an ordered weighted, uh, weighted average, well, the weights, you associate some weight of importance to not to a given feature, but instead you, uh, you assign that to score ranks. So the highest gets a certain weight, and then the second, another weight. And if you take, for example, some weights, like here you have five features and five weights, and if you say that the first feature, even if it is the highest one, so there is a correlation that is really high for a given feature, 
you assign a very l l low weight because it can be due to a chance, in fact, because you know that you need at least two or three because one, it does, for example, you have two attacks that come from China. Well, uh, almost all the, uh, the attacks come from ch either from China or from the uh, US. So by using this, you can say things like most of the feature must be high in order to link to events to, to, to the same root cause. Okay, so uh, just going to show you an example of application of that approach, and then I will give the word to Andy. So we have applied this approach to different types of data sets, and among others, we have applied that to uh, rogue AV software. And we have published then the results in the uh, Symantec report on rogue security software in October last year. So, um, what is a rogue AV software? Well, I think I don't have to repeat that because now it's well known. Uh, it's a kind of misleading application. Um, some people call that also uh, a, uh, a scareware. Um, it propagates through different techniques, uh, mostly techniques that um, aim to lure users into installing some software. And the purpose is, of course, to make money because uh, when it, it's kind of um, malware that when you install it, it will ask you money to, to have the full version, but in, but in fact, it, it, it is just a fake software, so it does, no, it does almost nothing. So you have here some screenshots of um, a rogue AV software, uh, such as malware protector or, or antivirus XP 2008, and we see more and more of uh, samples of, of that kind of uh, threat. So we wanted to apply our approach, triage, to um, this kind of data. So what did we look at? Well, we selected about um, 6,500 uh, domain names that somehow looked suspicious. And then uh, um, in those domains, they were pointing to roughly 4,300 different IPs. And you see that in those IPs, uh, some of them were clearly hosting uh, only rogue AV software, whereas only 110 were hosting both rogue AV and uh, normal domains or some other threats, uh, sorry, some other threats. And finally, what is really interesting is that you have also roughly 1,500 domains that were hosting both rogue AV software but also normal websites, uh, normal domains. So this is not easy then to figure out which rogue AV domains might be due to, to the same group of people. So yeah, so just a, one more slide on the generation of the data. So you see here the um, domains that we have taken from SafeWeb um, or from malware domain list, uh, malware URL host file, and then what we did, we, we have added other data. Um, so we wanted to know, for example, uh, to get information about uh, where the domain is hosted, so DNS, and we, we used uh, RobTech to uh, do that. Then we wanted to know uh, the availability of the servers, then we wanted to know who is the, the owner of the domain or who has created uh, those domain. And lastly, we have taken advantage of SafeWeb and Malware Domain List to, um, to include in the analysis information about threats. So which threats are present on each uh, domain. And this is our feature set. And then we apply the approach that I have shown. So we apply the uh, MCDA, a multi-criteria clustering on this data set. And what we find out, so the aim is of course to analyze the campaigns. So you see all, all, all the point here is to find the root cause. So to group all those domains, all the domains that might be due to the same campaign, so to, to the same group of people. 
And also, what are the inter interconnections between the web servers where we find those RogeV software, the RogeV domains, and the information that we have collected, like the registrants, the um, creation date, etc. So these are our findings. Um, roughly 4,000 domains could be grouped in only into only 39 campaigns. And we find even one campaign that is made of roughly 1,500 domains. So it means that all those domains were created by the same group of people, the same modus operandi. Most campaigns are short-lived, a few days or a few weeks, but we found two large-scale campaigns that have lasted for, for months, and even one for more, more than eight months. Then, as you, as you will see in the next picture, we have found out that the rogue domains are created in a bulk fashion, clearly. And the same campaign is usually split between different uh, uh, internet service pro providers. Now, just to give you an idea of what we get with the approach is uh, you get a multidimensional graph where you can plot all the features that you look at and all the data. This is one example of a rogue AV uh, campaign which involved, in fact, 750 domains, rogue AV domains, that might be due, apparently, to the same group of people because all the domains, you see that all the domains are linked to by a certain number of features, but not always the, the same features. Some domains are linked by, so just to give you the legend, so in blue, you have the RogueV domain, so the, 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 the name of, of the domains. Then in yellow, you have uh, the IP address in slash 2024 of the web servers. And in red, you have the, the email address of the, the person who has created the domain registrant uh, uh, email. And you see, for example, that all those domains were created by the same persons, apparently, on the same date. Then you have bubbles, in fact, like a bubble here, created on the same day and due to the same person. Uh, but you have different networks. So it means that they try to split, the, 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 to host all the domains on at least two different IPs, just in case one ISP tries to take down um, a whole set of rogue domains. So you have, yeah, and sorry, here you have the creation date, of course, here. So it lasted eight months, but only on two or three days, you see that they created a large amount of those rogue AV domains. So by linking all those events, which are in this case rogue AV domains, based on a, com on a, s a number of features, but not always the same ones, we are able to unveil such complex uh, patterns. So just to see, show you a close-up here, uh, the zoom. So we found out that all the domains were an extension .cn, although none of the domains were actually or physically in uh, China. So it's, it's quite weird. OK, so what did we learn? Uh, thanks to the application of our uh, triage framework, we, we learned, of course, that the user, but this is n not new, but the user is the primary uh, target. Uh, and in fact, what we found out in all those campaigns is that quite few uh, rogue AV domains and quite few campaigns rely on drive-by downloads. Uh, this is quite amazing, in fact. So they prefer to pay because they make a lot of money. Uh, they can make much more money than what you and I can have in, in, <laughs> in even in one year. Um, uh, there are some figures that you can find uh, on the on blogs, but usually they can even an affiliate can make mm, more money than you can earn in in one year, just in a few weeks. So they prefer to pay to create those, those domains and to host them on ISPs that don't really look after um, the domain that, that they are trying to create. Then, uh, so as I said, it's very different from the exploit uh, website. Then what we found out is, of course, that blacklisting is, is strange. It's not useful. Uh, even not only IP, but also the domain base, because they have tools to create those domains in a bulk fashion. 
The only way to take down those rogue AV campaign, in this case, we found out that it is through the payment uh, processing site or through techniques that are based on uh, DNS. Okay, so uh, just to conclude my uh, first part and then I will uh, leave the stage to Andy. So triage is in fact one application um, uh, of Wombat where we try to analyze the threat that we are observing through a multi-criteria uh, decision-making scheme. So this is a new multi-criteria clustering and classification uh, technique uh, for the data set that we collect. And the next step is of course to integrate triage with the WAPI and with FIRE. And why is it useful? Well, of course, to get better insights into how uh, the criminals in the cyberspace uh, uh, function and how and when they change their uh, tactics. And then it automates also the identification of networks of attackers. So it shows you uh, which event might be linked to the same groups of, of uh, people, of, of gangs. And then it can help us also to go toward an early warning system. Now, um, it is my pleasure to introduce you, Andy, who is going to talk about FIRE, which is another application of, um, of uh, Wombat. And Andy, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so <laughs> uh, welcome, everybody, also from my side. Um, as I already, already saw, um, told you, in the second part of this talk, I want to introduce a system called FIRE that we developed in the Wombat project. Um, FIRE stands for Finding Rogue Networks, and in this system, what we want to do is to attribute the attacks that we see on the internet to networks. Um, why do we want to do this? Well, we heard a couple of uh, times already today that the um, structure of the threats in the internet is changing. So what we are seeing now is organized criminal um, gangs that have power, that have money, and they can afford their own networks, their own malicious networks that, are, uh, that exist solely for the purpose of uh, distributing malicious content. Um, so what everybody knows are um, bulletproof hosting networks. Um, they guarantee the availability of the hosted resources regardless of any content, and they host every uh, kind of shady stuff that we know from the internet. I put a couple there, but you all, you all know this. Um, so what's the difference between a benign network and the so-called rogue network? Well, benign networks serve malicious content too. However, um, the difference is that rogue networks serve this uh, malicious content persistently for a long time. Um, if you complain at a legitimate network, about some servers that host malicious content, then they usually take it down and remove the content. Um, um, on the other hand, for example, the Russian business network's well-known bulletproof hoster um, was taken down some time ago for a short time. Atrivo in the cage, Mikolo, the 3FN network. Um, all those networks are examples for uh, for bulletproof hosters where um, malicious content can stay online for an, a very long extended period of time, uh, in some instances even for years. So what we want to do is we want to defeat the root cause in the Wombat project. So basically we aim at taking down the rogue networks that we see. Um, why do we want to do this? Um, if we can really take down a rogue network, this has a significant effect on malicious activities. I put you here the numbers um, for a drop in spam volume on the internet. Well, when Atrivio was taken down, the reduction was 20%, but, however, but when Mercola was taken down, for example, um, the spam volume dropped 75%. For a very short time, it was taken online later. Uh, but at least for a couple of months, the spam volume on the internet was reduced greatly, and that's what we want to achieve. Another thing that we can do, we can create efficient blacklists. So if we see a lot of malicious activity from one network, we can just say, okay, 
this is probably a rogue network and we can block all the hosts on this network even if you haven't seen malicious activity from certain hosts. So we can basic basically predict where malicious activity will be coming from. So what are the objectives of the fire system? Um, my first, we want to systematically, automatically identify the networks that act maliciously. Um, what we also want to do, this is the second goal of the fire system, um, we want to notify legitimate networks that they host malicious activity. Because often, um, like uh, legitimate ISPs don't even know that they host malicious activity because they have so many clients, they have so many servers, they just cannot find all the activity that, I that exists on their network. So the ultimate goal would be to assist legitimate ISPs to de-peer uh, rogue networks. Well, this is hard to do. However, um, examples have shown that by exposing those networks to the media, this is possible. I will have an example or some examples later on. Um, well, and in general, we want to make the internet a safer place. So if we make it difficult for the cyber criminals to find safe havens for their illicit activities, so if we force them to move from server to server because they get shut down, if we move to force them from country to country, like in the case of the Russian business network where the whole network had to move to China, then we can make the life of the criminals harder. And that's what we want to achieve. So what are the challenges? In this, uh, for the system. Well, first we have to identify malicious networks. Um, how do we identify malicious content? Um, Olivier already told us um, we have a lot of sensors in place. I will show later um, what sensors exactly we use for fire. Um, and the question is, however, when do we consider a host malicious? Um, a lot of malicious um, malicious stuff is hosted on compromised servers. And we are not interested in compromised servers. Those are just poor guys who get the server hacked and then they serve, let's say, drive-by downloads. And this has nothing to do with a real rogue network. So we have to find a way to filter out those compromised servers. So how do we do this? Um, well, the main difference is the longevity of the, con uh, of the online time of the content. So. If we see that content, malicious content is hosted for a prolonged period of time, then we can assume with using some heuristics that this is probably a malicious host or a host in a malicious network. Um, one last point, how do we account for size? Um, we have really large ISPs and hosting providers and they have a lot of malicious activity. They have a lot of servers that are usually not that well administered. so they get hacked, they serve malicious binaries, whatever, and um, the absolute numbers are high. However, those are not the really bad guys. They are good guys that try to clean their servers, but they cannot cope up with the work. So we also have to filter out that. So how does our system work? Um, well, first, we monitor malicious activities. We have classified malicious activities he, um, here in these four points. Um, first, we monitor botnet command and control servers. Uh, we monitor phishing servers. We monitor drive-by download servers. And we monitor spam servers. Once we have found a server that conducts one of those illicit activities, we uh, capture the network traffic. And we replay it to the server. And we look how long the server responds. So Usually after some time, the server gets cleaned up and we can, we can notice this. So basically we cannot download the virus bi uh, binary anymore. Then we say, okay, now the server is offline. And thus this allows us to determine the uptime of malicious servers. Um, once we have this, we aggregate the malicious IP addresses at an autonomous system level. So uh, what is an autonomous system? I think we all know this. Um, I put the definition up there, but it's just a network on the internet. It's a bunch of computers controlled by a single entity. Um, so what we, what we can do is once we have identified uh, the IP of a server that acts maliciously, we resolve the IP address to his, uh, to his autonomous system number. And what we do is we 
compute a maliciousness score for the autonomous system number. Um, I will show you how this works. Um, we have been monitoring um, those threats since August 2008, so almost two years. Okay, now for some details. Um, first, the data collection. Why do we need what in the CNC servers? What we have is the Anubis sandbox. I don't know if you all know Anubis. Um, this is a sandboxing system that can analyze malicious code. So basically you go to the web interface, you upload the virus that you have found somewhere on your computer, and it tells you, okay, this is, this is malicious because it does that, 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 that. So what we do is we look at the network traffic, and whenever a bot connects to some controlling, uh, command and control server, um, we, of course, log the IP address of this command and control server. Um, what we're also looking at are drive-by download hosting providers. So what we first do is we have a client honeypot, Capture HPC. Um, this works uh, more or less, you have a virtual machine with a browser running automatically that serves to some URLs, and sooner or later this browser gets exploited. Um, in that case, what usually happens is that uh, binary is downloaded from somewhere. The interesting thing is the binary is usually downloaded from somewhere else. So it's not from the server, from the web server that got hacked and had an SQL injection or whatever that exploits your browser, but it's uh, downloaded from a server in the background. And we are interested in that server in the background because those servers are usually um, located in the malicious networks. So we get those IPs. Um, also, we have uh, WebPowet which is a website uh, analysis system. So basically you can um, post URLs to WebAWET, isaacclip.org, and you get a complete um, analysis what this website does, if there is shell code somewhere hidden in JavaScript, and it says, okay, this website tries to download the binary from that server, and again, we get the server in the background and we feed it into Fire. Um, Finally, we have uh, fishtank.com. We get a lot of uh, phishing sites from fishtank. Um, however, the data from fishtank is not really accurate for our purposes. Um, why is that? Because we have to do a lot of filtering for compromised servers, for fast flux toasts. So we do a lot of uh, post processing for fishtank, and then we find some sites that really stay on for a long time. Um, and we add the piece of those servers to fire. Um, I had one data source um, on the slide before that was uh, spamming servers. Spamming servers are not used for fire right now. Um, any ideas why this could be? No. Um, of course, spamming is usually done by bots. So we have um, owned user machines in some legitimate ISP ranges, and the command and control server, of course, is located in a malicious network and control, uh, controls those machines, but the spam actually gets sent out from legitimate IP ranges, so we cannot use this for uh, our analysis. What's interesting here is that we made a um, correlation analysis, and if a network shows one of those three um, uh, malicious, malicious activities, so if you have a, a command control server in, in a network, then you usually have a very high probability to find also the other two malicious activities. So those three are highly correlated. For spam, this is completely not true. That's why we left it out. So once we do this, we make a, a data analysis. So first, we look at the longevity of the malicious IP addresses. Um, as I told you before, the vast majority of malicious content is taken down within a few uh, days, usually. Um, however, some malicious content stays on for a very long time. In this example, put for more than, for more than a year. Um, what we see here is the drop-off for botnets and phishing servers. So we see a lot of servers for, with an uptime of only one, two, three, four days, and that's it. However, we have a very, very long tail where a lot of servers are located in malicious networks and they stay online for months and more. So what we just need to do, just need to do, <laughs> easier said than done, um, we have to cut off the very left 
part of this graph. Um, right now, we use the thresholds of, I think, five days. And everything that stays on longer than five days is probably in a malicious network. Um, for drive-by downloads, the situation is different. We have a drop-off in the uh, in the time on the online time of the IPs. However, it's not as deep as for phishing and for uh, uh, botnets. So why is this? Um, I told you before, setting up a drive-by download requires a lot of know-how. So setting up a phishing page is something that everyone can do. Everyone can copy a website and put it on his own server, and also everyone can uh, create, for example, an IRC channel that is used for command and control uh, purposes of bots. You can just join the channel and it's there. So this, on the other hand, needs a lot of know-how. You need to uh, be able to exploit the browser. You need to hack websites that distribute your exploit. And in the very end, you need the uh, download server in the background. In that case, um, the criminals usually uh, make sure that the server is really online, that is available. And thus, you see a lot of bulletproof hosting here. And that's why we take all the IPs that we find from that data source directly into account. So, um, OK, this is the formula that we use for uh, computing a uh, mass score for an autonom autonomous system. It's the only formula I have, I promise. Um, the interesting thing is not the sum on the right, which is just, uh, it just takes all the IPs from the three data sources that I present. However, there is the scaling factor for network size. Um, network size is important, but it's hard to determine the size of a network. So what we have here is an estimation. It's the size that the network um, announces to the outside. In many cases, we know that it's not true, because sometimes networks um, announce a really huge range, but only have a couple of machines online. And the opposite is also true when um, NAT is used, and the network size to the outside is very small. But in reality, there are a lot of hosts behind the NAT. So it's an estimation, but it works quite well. So now what we've done, we have processed a lot of networks um, with our method. And this is one of the results. Um, this is a result from summer 2009. Um, I wasn't too lazy to update the slides, but um, the actual the numbers from this summer are really boring. They're just large ISPs. So this one gives much more information. So what do we have here? Um, first place, IPNAP. Um, they are definitely, uh, they were definitely the leader in IRC-based botnets. They are still. Um, we have um, in place six the Leonidovich network. This was a drive-by download campaign. Um, we have the Petersburg Internet network. This was SUS botnet hosting. We have the Global Net Access. They have uh, they've been the leaders in phishing uh, pages. So this looks really nice. We have the top 10 networks by fire. So what we want to do now is um, we want to know, is this correct? The problem is there is no ground truth. We cannot say that these are really the malicious networks. We cannot just, I don't know, mail their admin and ask, hey, are you the Russian business dudes? We cannot do this. So what we did is we looked at what others say. So that's why we have this uh, four columns at the right. Uh, well, IPNAP, for example, is number one in Shadow Server, another uh, monitoring system. Then we have the Petersburg Internet Network, which is um, found by, which was found by Seuss Tracker in sixth place. Um, one interesting thing is maybe the Novikov Alexander Leonidovich Network, because none of the other automated systems um, found it at that time, so they had no idea about this network. However, there were blocks. This is the very rightmost column. Um, those blogs already uh, wrote about the uh, Leonidovich network. And they said, hey, look at this network. There's something going on. They are purely malicious. And Fire already found this. The other guys did not. So this is pretty impressive for an automated system. Um, so what we also do, we did it the other way around. So we looked at Shadow Server and compared it with the Fire rank. So in the in the rank one, we agree. This is IP NAP. They are malicious. Perfect. However, in rank two, 
uh, for Shadow Server, this is Access for All. And Access for All definitely has a lot of malicious activity. However, the main problem is not that they are malicious, but that this is a really huge network. So that's why Fire degrades it to a rank lower than 100. And I think that Fire is right. Those guys are not the ones we are, we are going after. We are going after uh, IPNAP, but not Access for All. So, a case study. Um, in uh, September 2008, Atrivo was uh, DP'd by, um, by his two peers. Um, first, by Pacific Internet Exchange, where what happened was uh, there were some articles popping up in the media. So they said, okay, Atrivo, this is the American branch of the uh, Russian business network. And they said, hey, those are malicious guys, so we have to do something about it. And it's, uh, well, the word came to Pacific Internet Exchange, and they said, okay, it's too much, we repeat them. So Fire noticed an immediate drop in the mail score, and then it carried on for one week with the United Layer connection, and then United Layer connected, uh, disconnected them too and the mail score dropped to zero. So this was a success story, not uh, initiated by FIRE, but monitored, and we hope for this success um, initiated by FIRE. That's what the system is all about. So um, we have, of course, a website where we uh, publish all these um, results. Um, this is the, uh, block, uh, the, the status from, uh, yeah, end of August. Um, as you can see in the first spots, there is the planet. There are always a lot of malicious activity in, uh, there's always a lot of malicious activity in the planet network. Uh, what else is there? Uh, local web, always there. OVH, always there. So those are really big providers and they, they always make the top spots. And um, of course, on the website, you can also do fancy stuff like getting the history for all the networks that I present here. You can rank by country. You can download the block list if you want for all the IPs that we found. And of course, you can also get this fancy map where we just put on all the IPs that we found. Um, well, little surprise here. Um, mainly, we see IPs from America then followed by China and Europe. Uh, Russia is a bit misleading because a lot of the servers in Russia are in the same spot in St. Petersburg. There, is, there are a couple and they only, they are only shown as one dot here. They are also pretty malicious. So this was the part two of this talk um, on fire. So summarized for the whole, uh, whole Wombat project, we have to say that attack attribution is an emerging field. And the thing is, it is tough. It requires a multidisciplinary approach and international collaboration. Uh, what we need urgently is uh, stable representative uh, data sets. And well, here's my invitation to you. If you want to help us make the internet a safer place, um, everybody is welcome to host an SGNet sensor and benefit from the data set. Um, of course, the more sensors we get, uh, the more we know, the more we can counter those attacks. Um, it's actually pretty easy to um, set up an SGNet sensor. What you need is just four IP addresses, um, a very old computer, and you have to sign an NDA. Um, in response, what you get is the access to the data sets that we already have. Um, you will get the data mining tools that we developed, and you have, we have the web interface and you can share the interesting results with us. Okay, and that concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention. Uh, any questions? Um, you spoke about different um, systems to, to detect all the attacks. Um, do you have uh, a few information about the types of honeypots you used? The honeypots? Um, yes, we have the honeypots in the SGNet, but for Fire we have the client honeypot, the Capture HPC that I mentioned before. So this is, this is basically the only honeypot that we have. Um, all the rest 
is um, what we get from Anubis are for samples that are automatically uploaded by other hunting pods. So we have corporations, for example, Nepenthes has a uh, module that automatically uploads to Anubis. So if we have, if you download a Nepenthes installation, um, for example, from your Linux distribution, you install it, you activate the Anubis module, and then you send basically data to us to fire via Anubis. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much, Andreas. Welcome.